I am allergic to the word failure. The only way you fail is if you don't try or you quit on yourself. Everything else is just experimentation. That's all it is. Welcome, Crafted Entrepreneurs. Today, we have an amazing guest. She's probably the smartest person we've ever had on the show. We have the amazing Alex Carter. She is a professor at Columbia Law School, and she is known as the queen of negotiation. She's the best-selling author of Ask for More, 10 Questions to Negotiate Anything. She's famous for her quote, you know what you deserve, ask for it relentlessly. So welcome, Alex, to Crafted Entrepreneur. Thank you, Kayla. I've been following you for years, and I'm thrilled we're finally having this conversation today. Okay, so I love to get back into like your childhood right from the get-go, because when people hear how much you've accomplished in your life, they kind of start to shut down because they're like, wow, she's really amazing. So, you know, we all start somewhere. So talk to me about like when you were a child, did you know you were going to be a professor at Columbia Law School one day? Absolutely not. In fact, Kayla, (laughs) I'll tell you two things about me. One is that I used to have a lot of trouble negotiating for myself and asking Mm -hmm. for more for myself. If you were my friend, if you were my colleague, if you were my kid, right, or a family member and you needed something, oh, forget it. Mommy was the junkyard dog who was going to go out and get it for you. But when it came to me, I would hesitate. And so we can talk about how I undid some of that programming. But the second piece of it, did I know I was going to be a professor at Columbia Law School? Here's what I want to tell you. I almost didn't apply for this job because I wasn't sure I was qualified. So if Mm. there's nothing else, nothing else your audience takes from this, it's that you should go, if you feel called to do something, you should step into that. And that's what I did. And as a result, here I am 15 years later, I'm a professor, I've won teaching awards, I'm in my dream job, and I almost didn't apply. So never, ever hold yourself back from that opportunity. Wow. Okay. I love that. Your story is so inspiring. Now you said you weren't the type of person that stood up for yourself. You would be, you know, standing up for everybody around you. What, what was going on? Like, were you modeled that? What were your parents like to make you go, Oh, you know, I'm going to put my needs down and focus on other people. Yeah. You know, I grew up, you know, to two wonderful parents in a relatively traditional household. You know, my mom was home for part of my childhood and my dad was a lawyer like me. He was out working quite a lot. My mother eventually went back and became a teacher. And so Kayla, it's so interesting because I'm a law teacher and I was born to a lawyer (laughs) and a teacher, right? So, you know, sometimes you look back and you think, wow, Here's how the pieces of the puzzle came together. But I think I absorbed this message somehow that especially as a woman, and I know we have a lot of women listening right now on this podcast, especially as a woman, that somehow if I asked for more or I stood up for my value for myself, that it wasn't nice, it wasn't collaborative, maybe people weren't gonna like me, they might think something about me, And then I had this moment, Kayla, the first time I ever had to negotiate my own salary and I got a good offer. I mean, the the number was a little bit higher than what I expected. And I almost took it on the spot because I thought, well, if it's good enough, that should be good enough, right? I should take that. But I had just enough sense to call a senior woman in my field and I said, can you give me some advice? You know, what should I do? And she said, oh, I'm going to tell you what to do, Alex. You're going to get back in there and you're going to ask for more. And here's why. When you teach someone how to value you, you are teaching him how to value all of us. So if you're not going to go out and ask for more for yourself, 
Do it for the woman coming after you. Do it for the sisterhood. In that moment, I realized I'm somebody who wants to promote other women. I'm someone who wants other women to rise. I want to let the ladder down for the people after me. And I didn't realize until that moment that by going out and fiercely asking for what I deserve and backing it up 100% with my qualifications, of course, that I'm making it easier for the women who are coming after me to go for their dreams too. Wow. That's amazing. So you, you had this, you had to have been modeled that because you were raised by, it sounds like strong people with strong personalities to have the wherewithal to go. I'm going to ask for mentorship in this. I'm going to ask somebody who's gone before me what I should do. And then now that's the title of your book. Ask for more. Wow. It's come full circle there. That's pretty amazing. I absolutely, I love those types of stories of people really thinking about, you know, putting a hand down and bringing somebody up with them. So tell me what was it like, you know, when you're in your beginning stages of your law career, I, you know, this is going to sound so silly. Okay. But I just watched Suits. Okay. On Netflix. (laughs) I actually think it's like the most viewed. I just read a stat about it. Like it just like flew off and I loved it. I was like, I should go back to, I'm not, I mean, I don't know if I want to go back to school, but I was like, I would love to be a lawyer after watching that show. So, and I heard that it's like from my lawyer friends are like, that's probably the most accurate lawyer show out there. But anyway, all that being said, I saw the dynamic between what happens with women and men in that field. So how did you navigate that when you came on the scene? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because when I went to law school, my class was actually the first class in my law school's history that was more women than men. And so, you know, I remember that day that they told us and the men stood up and cheered. I don't know whether they thought this is great. We're going to have a lot of dating material or they were excited to have us in class. But then I was shocked, Kayla, when I went to my first legal job and it was a really interesting time. It was right after 9-11, actually. So there was a lot of uncertainty around jobs and everything. And I got into a room with everybody who had been selected for this job. And there were 70 of us. I looked around. There were only four other women in the room. So there were five of us out of 70. And I remember the conversation I had with myself in that moment where I thought, okay, so there's a way that I could look at this and think, this is, this is bad. This is going to be rough, but there's also a different way to look at this. They need me. They need to keep me. And so I went out and boldly asked, you know, I'd love to work with this partner. I'd love to work on this type of matter. I'd love to ask you out to lunch because I'd like to talk about the future for women at the firm and how I can advance myself. And so I actually used what made me different as my market advantage. And that's something, Kayla, that I have discovered you can replicate over and over again. I'll give you another example. I was going out to write a negotiation book, ask for more. And when I went to the bookshelf, almost Every other book out there that anybody had heard of was written by a guy and written by a guy who had like 20 years on me. And initially I thought to myself, oh gosh, does this mean nobody's going to buy this book? I'm a woman. Maybe I, I look too young. I'm, I wasn't an FBI agent. But then I realized, no, this is my market advantage because If everybody out there is serving different folks, then there's got to be a huge group of people who are waiting to be served in the way that only I can serve them. And so I personally have found being different, being a woman in male dominated environments my whole life, it's an advantage. And I use it to go out and to boldly serve the people who I know I can serve. Wow. So that fires me up so much because I always talk about in my marketing classes, you know, finding your niche and your experience is 
your special sauce. It is what makes you stand out compared to everybody else. If you're looking at 10 people who are doing the same thing as you, your experience is really what's going to help you make a lot more money. And a lot of people want to just blend in. They don't want to stand out usually because of their childhood trauma, Mm -hmm. but that's a whole nother podcast that you guys can listen into. But you know, you had this, this wherewithal to go, I'm willing to be seen. I'm willing to go on these lunches and have these conversations. And that probably helped you, I'm assuming go up and up and up to where you are today. It's all relationships. You know, I tell people in business, in negotiation, the relationship creates the deal and not the other way around. The truth is, Kayla, that at this point, I do business with people I like, people, you know, I resonate with, people where, you know, we know, we click, we're going to provide mutual value to each other. And so the great thing is, I never have to fake it because my clients are long-term clients and we know that together we're much stronger and we're there to help each other rise that's what it's all about and so one of my main pieces of advice to people who are starting out in business or starting out in their career is be intentional about your relationships because that's your capital that's your currency and that's the thing that over and over again when folks have a choice about who they want to do business with they're going to do business with people obviously as you've said many times in your marketing classes people they know they like and most of all they trust so a lot of times we have this image of people who are successful in business or negotiation that it's somebody who's like a shark they're super aggressive they're out to make the other person lose and i found exactly the opposite I am definitely capable of coming in and saying to you, Kayla, all right, cards on the table. Here's what I need to make this work. Tell me what's going on for you. What do you need? Let's have a frank conversation. And I know we can figure this out together in a way that advances us both. That approach has gotten me so much farther in life and honestly also made me a lot more money than if I were going out and trying to trick people every day of the week. Oh, I love that. That's what you call creating a win-win relationship. And as you're building up that relationship capital, the law of reciprocity happens, you know, where it's like when you've helped so many people win in your career, they eventually, they feel like they owe you, even though you've never said that, but it's like, I don't know if you've experienced that at all in your career. Yeah, I have. How about you? I have like so much where people, I'm a networker. So I'll always like, even after this, I'm like, okay, who does Alex need to know in my network and how can I connect them? My mind just thinks that way. And, you know, then I'll, I'll make connections and then people were like, oh, Kayla, I thought of somebody that you need to know. I'm like, sweet. Like I didn't have to ask for that, but it just, it just seems to happen. And then my relationships, you know, get bigger and better and it's awesome. I, that's what makes life. I feel like so fulfilling is knowing amazing people. I couldn't agree more. And I have to tell you that I feel really blessed at this point in my life and my career to be surrounded by folks who are constantly looking out for opportunities for me. And I'm doing the same. In fact, I have a, you know, a text chain of people who are doing the same type of work. I am we're authors, we're speakers. And the text chain is full of, Hey, I had this meeting today, I'd like to introduce you, or I just landed this client this year, they're looking for somebody next year, let me recommend you. And this, you know, this is all about abundance versus scarcity. And I am a big believer that there is more than enough out there for all of us. And so when in doubt for me, the answer is assume abundance. You know, I was coming up with a concept for a book And I discovered that another author had a similar idea for a book. And I reached out to her and said, you know, I'd love to help you. Is there anything I can do to advance you in your book? And she said, yes. And what are you working on? And I said, well, I'm working on something that's somewhat similar. And she said, let's join forces. Let's see how we can help each other. Right. Can you imagine as opposed to saying, oh, we're competing. No, thanks. Right. I'll see you maybe on the bestseller list. You know, let the best woman win. It's like, let's propel each other so that we're both at the top of the list. Let's go out and do it together. And I'm with you. If success means that I've got to make other people lose, 
then that's not what I'm about. Fortunately, success is a team sport. And I find that more and more, the higher up I get in my field, we got to get there together. Oh, I love that. Now, there might be people listening in that are like, okay, Alex, that sounds great because you're a professor at Columbia Law School and everybody's going to want to collaborate with you. What would you say to the person who's just getting started, who has maybe no success under their belt, but a whole lot of failure? How can they learn to collaborate and add value to people to start getting those win-win relationships? I love this question. Okay, Kayla, first of all, I'm going to reframe what you said. Okay. Ooh. So, cause what you said is what people are thinking. They're thinking, I don't have a lot of experience. I'm newer. I'm younger. I have a lot of failure or I don't have a track record. Okay. You have things you can use. You have advantages built in. Okay. Maybe you're a brand new college graduate. Instead of saying, I don't have experience. What do you have? You have more recent education. You might have more technological experience than somebody my age who's been out of college. I'm not going to say however many years. Maybe you can tap into a market that I can't. You know, I was counseling a young woman recently and she said, Alex, how am I going to, you know, apply for these jobs? I'm, I'm interested in journalism, but I, I'm so young. And I said, are these sites reaching Gen Z? Because if they're not, you're the person to do it. So always start from what you have. I am allergic to the word failure. To me, we do a lot of experimentation, don't we? In life, we try different businesses, we try certain prices. And when people say to me, I failed, I say, no, you didn't. You experimented with one course of action and you learned for some reason that that didn't work the way you wanted it to. Let's figure out what did you learn from that? And now let's experiment with something else, right? The only way you fail is if you don't try or you quit on yourself. Everything else is just experimentation. That's all it is. The last thing I want to say, Kayla, is, you know, I was one of the youngest people, most junior, applying for the job I'm in now. Remember how I told you I didn't think I had the qualifications? I thought I was too young. I didn't think I had the track record. But then I thought to myself, what do I have? If I'm younger than everybody else in the job pool, okay, I don't have as much experience, but I have a lot of energy. I have a lot of vision. I'm somebody who's been where your students are more recently. I understand their experience. And if you want somebody who's going to build a program over the next 30 years, you want me because that's what I'm going to be able to do. Start with what you have. And I'm here to tell you, you always have something. Wow. Okay. You know, the quality of our life is in direct correlation to the quality of questions that we ask ourselves, And and it just sounds like that's a very powerful question. Our mind, if we say, why would this person hire me? Our mind instantly goes blank. It goes, I don't know how to answer that. But what do I have? Our minds love to have the answers. So, wow, what a powerful question. I got to write that down. And I know that's in your book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's a nice refresher. Okay, yeah, that's right. That's a powerful question to ask, right? So, okay, you get into this amazing career. And tell me, like, you're now teaching students. I used to teach nursing students because I used to be an ER nurse. So I know what it's like to go back in there and go, oh, gosh, like, am I qualified? Have I had enough years of experience to be teaching these people, you know, life-saving techniques? So tell me about one of the most powerful maybe interactions you've had with a student so far in your career. Oh, my goodness. You know, I had a student early on in my career, Kayla, and this was a student who had overcome tremendous adversity, right? Had grown up really in poverty, in a really tough neighborhood, saw a lot of things on the street that most of us could never possibly imagine. And against all odds, ended up at Columbia Law School and was just excelling. And I remember meeting this student and sitting down with him one day and saying, 
I see something special in you. I, I want to tell you what I see in you. I think you could be a professor one day. That's what I see in you. And that was the day that I learned the transformative power of holding up a mirror to show someone what you see in them. I think some of the most powerful words in the English language are, I see this in you. And somehow that day, I gave him the vision and the confidence. And we talked about how we were gonna strategize his last year at law school, different credentials we were gonna help get him. And the most rewarding feeling on earth was then a few years later when I was able to hire him to be my co-professor at Columbia. And then several years after that, where he got a promotion to go be the number one, the Alex Carter at another law school. Oh, and wow. seeing him now as a professor, as a dad, as somebody who is just slaying life, it reminds me that really the reason I'm here, the whole reason I believe I'm on this earth is to let the ladder down and to show people what I see in them so that they can see it in themselves too. That's the single biggest thing I do as a teacher. And it's one of the reasons I love this job so very much. Oh my gosh, that gives me chills. How exciting and rewarding for you and for him too. But wow, you went first and just had that conversation with him. That's beautiful. Now on the flip side of that, have you ever had a student where you're like, oh, I don't think he or she's going to make it? And how did you have that conversation to get them to maybe turn things around? Woo, okay. I've got one for this too. And the great thing about this story, Kayla, is that it involves a verbal shift that I want to teach your listeners how to make. So I had a student I was working with, and in my class at Columbia, we're in class together, but we also practice together. We help actual clients resolve their disputes. So I'm running a program that's almost like a legal emergency room where people can come in, real people, and we help them with their problems. And that requires a really high level of dedication and ability. And I had this student who wanted to be a leader, wanted to perform, and she just wasn't there. I was getting feedback from other people on the team that you know there was some stuff that needed addressing. So I called her into my office. Now, when you're calling somebody in to give feedback, maybe that's even virtually, there's a way that people often do this, Kayla, where they'll say, you know, Alex, you've been great at this, but you're not so good at this other thing. And what happens is that when people hear, but they forget all of the good stuff and they focus in on the bad stuff and they get into the shame spiral and then it's really hard to get them out of it. And so when I teach people about negotiation, because make no mistake, this is a negotiation, right? I'm in a relationship with somebody. We're steering that relationship. We're negotiating. So instead, I said to that student, you have tremendous gifts and I want to be able to put you in a leadership position. We have work to do and I know you can do it. So let's start that together. So instead of saying you're great, but people question your commitment on the team, I said, you're great in some respects and here's what we need to do to get you to that next level. We're going to do this together. And that student, Kayla, heard the feedback. It was hard. There were tears. But when I tell you she plugged in, she felt supported. We did the work together. She led my program the following year and she did a fantastic job. So sometimes you've got to show people two things can be true. You can be awesome in some respects and here are the things we need to work on. But when you use and, people tend to feel supported rather than put down and defensive. Mm. Verbiage is really everything when you're talking to other people, also when you're talking to yourself, right? When have you seen the most powerful shift in yourself, okay? I heard you on Autumn, you know, I'm talking about Autumn Calabrese's podcast. 
Yeah. <laughs> and you were talking about how, you know, like everything, even when you're talking about your health, like the conversations you're having with yourself are extremely powerful. You're out speaking all over the place, plus running this huge division at Columbia Law School. Like you have a lot going on and sometimes your health can go on the back burner. So you've got to be having powerful conversations with yourself to put you first when, when it comes to this. So what does that look like for for you, like, what are the conversations you're having in this mind to, to get going at your pace? <laughs> yes. And, and I'm so glad you asked this question. You know, in addition to obviously my full-time work at Columbia, my speaking work, my writing, I'm also a mom to an almost 13 year old girl. I'm a wife. You, I mean, look, we've got like four jobs, Caleb, right? I right. mean, all of us, we have a lot of jobs. So I'll tell you the most powerful mental shift I've made in my conversations with myself is that there's one word I try never to use, and that word is why. Alex, why haven't you been able to lose weight? Why haven't you been prioritizing your eating? Why can't you get to bed at 930 instead of staying up doom scrolling on your phone until 11 p.m., right? So maybe some of you can relate to some of those. So why is often a blaming question. Can you hear it in my voice? It, it's a shaming and blaming question. And so what happens is that when we ask ourselves why, we tend to then keep ourselves stuck in the past stuck in blame and stuck in inaction. Instead, I like to be forward looking. I like to say, what's going on for me right now? Poor Alex, you've been stressed. What's been happening late at night when you've been feeling the urge to eat? What's happening for you that you haven't been able to meal prep? What support do you need to be able to make this happen for you? And one of the shifts that happened for me when I went from why to what, instead of why can't you do this to what support do you need, was that I realized, you know, I should hire help. You know, there are people in my community whose whole job it is to prepare meals and they love to do this. And this is how they support their families. And so I hired a local mom to help me with meals for myself and meals for my family And what a blessing. Here it is. Now I have the support I need and I'm helping another mom support her family, right? So when you move from why to what, you move from blame to diagnosis and you move from the past to what do I want the future to look like? So one tip for you all, instead of asking yourself, why can't I do this? Whatever this is, try asking yourself what, what's coming up for me? what emotions are there and what support do I need to go out and crush this, whatever it is. Oh, I love that. And it's the law of circulation at play. You invest in that local mom and then you have more time. You end up making more money. It comes back to you. So I always love to point out that that law is at play right there. So I need to get into the negotiation part because I love a good negotiation just for the thrill of it. I'm in real estate. And so we are constantly negotiating and I was just negotiating this morning and I'm just, I always want to see what else I can, what else I can, uh, you know, get and also give, okay. Trying to make win-win relationships, but you know, I like to stretch it. And my husband, he's like, don't risk it. Don't ask for that. And I'm like, go for no, you know, because that's just, I, that's my personality. I'm not scared of hearing the word no. Right. But a lot of people they they don't even want to get into negotiations because they're scared of that two letter word. So let's, let's talk about that. How can people set themselves up for success when it comes to negotiating specifically for the entrepreneurs listening in right now, they really struggle with how to set themselves up in the marketplace at a great price. So people will go, Oh, well, I'm going to charge a hundred dollars for this because that's what Sally down the street charges. And I like to focus on luxury offers you know, and I also have done a lot of work to get to that place, but how can people start to negotiate like the right price for their experience in the marketplace? Oh, I love it. Okay. So I want to take both of those because you talked about getting past. I know that was a lot. (laughs) No, it was 
but they they're connected. So there's a good reason you asked the way you did, because you were talking, Kayla, about the two negotiations that are involved in every deal. The first negotiation is not when you and I sit down and talk about this real estate project. The first negotiation is the one I'm having with myself. And that's what I call the internal negotiation. That's the mirror. And that, Kayla, is what I saw that was missing from so many negotiation books because everybody talks about what happens once you're at the table, but nobody talks about the mental roadblocks that we put up in front of ourselves before we even get to the table in the first place. And the biggest one is the fear of no. So many people are so afraid of no that they underprice themselves. Right now, if you're that person, if you're listening today and you think, oh, gosh, I have underpriced myself. Remember what I said before. That's experimentation. It's not a failure. You have experimented with what it's like to go out at a discount. And what happens when you do that is you may get too many clients. You can't serve them effectively. And you feel right. How do you feel when you've underpriced yourself? Resentful burnt out, stretched too thin, and nobody deserves that, do they? You don't deserve that. And guess who else doesn't deserve that? Your client. They deserve to have the version of you that is totally fired up, ready to go, and feeling fully valued. That's what they deserve. So if you're a people pleaser and you're listening to this podcast, I want you to know the way you can please people is to go out and boldly step into your worth, okay? So here's the thing. If you're afraid of hearing no, I have one forward question for you that you can ask. It's what I call my no buster because this is the question that turns no's into yeses. And here it is. What are your concerns? Mm. Kayla, that offer sounds awfully high. What are your concerns? Um, we can't do the deal at that level. What are your concerns? Um, I'm not sure I want to join your company or your team. Tell me, what are your concerns? Over and over again, I found that this question, instead of why, remember, because why puts people on the defensive, what yep. are your concerns is a sincere, open way to understand what the barriers are, what's going on for that person. And when you have that information, then often you're able to help them understand how maybe that concern doesn't apply, or maybe there's a way you can work together to get through that concern, right? So that's a big tool you can use to help you get past that, ooh, you know, I don't want no. Last thing I'm gonna say on no, Kayla, is that no is awesome. You know, you referenced this, go for no. And I think this is um, Andrea Waltz's work. I just love that book. It's fabulous. And I, I want to give her a shout out. Love I've had shouting her on the out. podcast too. Oh, she's mm -hmm. fabulous. <laughs> she and I talked, she's somebody who reached out to me and said, I'd like to promote your book because we women need to be supporting each other. So I want to publicly call out her book and say, pick up, go for no. It's awesome. But here's what I learned. No means you're successful. If you're not getting a no, it is time to raise your prices. Let me say that again. If 100% of people or even 95% of people are saying yes, you are priced too low. Because when you get to that sweet spot where you're really being valued, you're going to be selective. And it's okay to inch up little bit by little bit. You talked about that, Kayla. You didn't start where you are now, right? Start where you are test the market. And then when you start to get overbooked, keep going, raise it, raise it, raise it. I went up by 10 to 15% every time I raised my prices. And I'm now charging, you know, 10 to 20 times what I was charging when I first started out. And I'm getting it often, not all the time, but I'm getting it often, right? So it's testing it until you really believe it. OK, so that's kind of the mental game. There's one tip I want to give your audience for the second part of the negotiation when you're talking to somebody and it's not the tip you're expecting. A lot of people think I'm going to teach them something to say. 
actually what I want to teach you is zip it. What I call mm -hmm. landing the plane. Okay. I wonder how often you've seen this Kayla. So somebody says, here's my offer, right? Here's my masterclass. Here's my digital program. Here's my team. And then the silence makes them nervous. So they jump in and they say, well, I know it may seem expensive at first, but I promise once you get in, you're going to find that it's really, eh, don't do it. Make your offer, make your request, and then land the plane, silence. And do you know, if you let there be just three and a half seconds of silence, research shows you are more likely to get a high value move from the other side. So. Sometimes it's not about talking, it's about silence, letting it marinate, and letting the other person come to you. Wow, land the plane. I love that silence can go so far sometimes. And I think the more insecurities that you're struggling with, the more you feel like you have to compensate with words. So yes. it's really important that you have that conversation with yourself, sell yourself on what on what you're doing, right? And then you're going to feel more confident to sit in three and a half seconds of silence because sometimes it feels like oh, forever. <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, and I just want to say, Kayla, that for those of you who are listening and not watching this on YouTube or on Kayla's platforms, you're missing me basically like doing the big ups and all sorts of gestures every time Kayla talks because the self esteem thing is so real. It's insecurity. We want to make people comfortable. We're nervous to let something hang out there. Trust in your value. Just a quick story. I was teaching a mom to negotiate and she said, Alex, I can't do this. I'm not a, I'm not a businesswoman. I'm a mom. I'm home with my kids. And do you know, she called me one day and said, oh my God, it works. So she's been working at a summer camp over the summer so that her kids get free tuition at the summer camp. And one day she wanted to bring a guest, a cousin for a week. And she wanted to ask them to comp the cousin so that she wouldn't have to pay just like her kids. So she called up and said, I've been working here a long time. Can you comp my cousin? And the camp director said, oh, I don't know. I don't think we can do that. And she just said, hmm. And he said, well, I guess you've been working here a long time. Maybe I could give you 50% off. Hmm. Silence. And then he said, oh, what the heck? You've been working here a long time. Let him come. That's great. No charge. Okay. So just to let you know, a little silence. I don't care how much training you have, how long you've been at home, maybe as a stay at home parent, you can do it. And it produces big results. Oh my goodness. You are so good at telling stories. I love oh. it. I could sit here and listen all day. Now it's got my brain going. What is the hardest negotiation you've had to go through and facilitate in your career? All right. So I'll get a bit um, personal here. And I, I talk about this a bit in Ask for More. You know, it was important to me, Kayla, when I was writing a book, a lot of the books I saw made the author seem like they'd never had a bad day in their life. They'd never had a failure. They'd never had a difficult negotiation. They never had a moment where it didn't go right. And it was really important to me to write the way that I teach and the way that I lead, which is from a place of authenticity. You know, and honestly, I found that when I share my struggles, I can connect to more people because they know that I've overcome some of the stuff that they're working on and I'm still working on it too. So the toughest negotiation I ever had was, you know, when I was writing, ask for more, my dad was sick with a terminal disease and, you know, I got into a totally avoidable kind of confrontation with a member of my family because the two of us were both really broken and hurting and wanting to do the right thing for my dad. And at the time, coming from a place of fear, it seemed like we had two different ideas about how to do that. And so initially, 
I didn't handle that well. Like I kind of exploded and said, hey, you know, I'm doing the right thing here and you've got to get on board, you know? And then I went back and I thought about it. And I thought about how, isn't this the perfect teaching example? Because one of the things I teach is that there are two emotions that blow up our conversations like none other. And those emotions are fear and guilt. Whenever people are losing their cool, including me, it's often because they're feeling one or more of those big two. And in my case, I was like, what's gonna happen to my dad? Fear, guilt, maybe I should be doing more. Maybe I'm not doing everything he would want me to do. Am I doing a good enough job? And it turns out that my other family member was feeling the same way. And so that, you know, quote unquote, failure or difficult moment, right, was me actually really learning something profound, which is that emotions are always going to be there. And sometimes there are things you can't solve, like a terminal disease. You know, my dad, thank God, lived to see Ask for More published. He lived through the pandemic. He passed away last year very peacefully when it was his time. And you can't negotiate against a terminal illness. But you can negotiate with your family members so that all of you are pulling together to do the right thing for that loved one. That's the place we got to. And I tell that difficult story in the book because I want people to know it's okay to struggle. It's okay if sometimes things don't turn out the way you want. Everything is a learning experience. And I'm still learning, Kayla, especially when it comes to those tough family situations. Those are often the most difficult negotiations I have. Mm -hmm. Well, there's so much more charged emotion behind those types of situations. Well, I cannot wait for people to get their hands on your book and learn more about that situation. I love how authentic you are and how you're just like laying it, laying it all out there. Uh, you know, if we could have a stereotype of a law professor, that's not what I would like think of. So <laughs> I love that. It's like, oh, this is like blowing my mind right now. I absolutely love that. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Great question. So what I'm working on, again, to be transparent in my business is, you know, a lot of the work that I do, Kayla, is behind closed doors of very large companies or behind you know, closed doors at the United Nations. That's where I do a lot of teaching or if you're at Columbia Law School and through my social media, you know, and other programs, I'm committed to access. Not everybody is going to be at a large company or working at the UN. And really my passion and my mission is around giving high quality negotiation advice to everybody making that accessible, making it affordable, making it understandable and approachable for people so that they can improve their lives. And so in the next five years, I am on fire to bring this message to as many people as possible and in a way that feels accessible for them. So that's what I'm looking to do. And so I'm working on another book. I'm working on a bunch of initiatives that I can't talk about just yet, but that are going to bring this level of negotiation teaching to millions of people all around the world. That's what I want to do. That and it's my daughter's last five years at home before she goes to college. And so really, when I envision this, I want to be showing my daughter that Moms can be bosses and I'm going out to make my dreams come true and to make it so that she can live a wonderful life, but also to be deeply connected at home and be spending time investing in the relationships that mean the most to me. Mm, so good. Me and you are in the same shoes when it comes to our kids because my oldest will be an adult. They're the same age. So <gasps> I get that because it's like <gasps> five years. It doesn't seem like that long. and you realize as they get older, they actually need more from yes. you emotionally and just, uh -oh. oh, it's a lot. And I'm like, it's so great that you could really be able to say yes, you know, at that point in your career, say yes to the things you really want to do that are going to have the most impact on the world 
that are in alignment with your mission and then say no to the things that are like just time suckers that aren't going to help move the needle. Right. Amen to all of that. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, Alex, thank you so much for being on the show today. I learned so much and I'm, I'm like thoroughly entertained. I love everything that you taught, all the stories. It was so good. What is one last thing you want to leave for all the entrepreneurs listening in? Don't chase other people's dreams for your life. You know, five years ago, I got an offer from a prestigious textbook company to write a textbook in my field. And I thought to myself, this is what I should do. This is what a law professor does. I should do this. And I woke up every day feeling dead inside when I decided to write this textbook. And then I had a student, Kayla, a really wise student who came to me, he's almost my age, came from India to study with me for a year. And he said, professor, I have a motto, a personal motto, and it's this, only do what only you can do. And I thought to myself, can only I write a textbook? And instantly I said, no, there are lots of people that can do this. What's the thing that only I can do? And I thought, you know, I have a special gift and also a special heart for making this material accessible to everyday people in their lives. That's what I think only I can do. And when I made that decision, not to chase somebody else's vision of what my life would look like, but to do the thing that was going to light me up, I couldn't stop writing that book. And I found an agent right away. I landed a book deal. And the book now is in hundreds of thousands of people's homes all over the world. And it's all because I decided to do the thing that only I can do. And so that's my piece of advice to you. Life is too short to chase someone else's dreams for you. Do what lights you up. Do the thing that only you can do. And that's when you're going to find the most success but also, as I can speak to from personal experience, the most fulfillment. I wake up every day doing what I believe I was meant to do on this earth, and that is what I want for you too. So powerful. And luckily for all of you listening in right now, you can pick up Alex's book anywhere where books are sold. And you can also invest in some of her classes that she has on her website. We're going to make sure to link those up in the show notes because she she will teach you how to become a powerful negotiator. So that is a great investment. No matter what career you are in, you're going to need to know how to negotiate. So thank you so much again, Alex, for being on the show. And I can't wait to hear everybody's feedback. Thank you, Kayla. This was an awesome conversation and I look forward to staying in touch. 